It's good to be here, guys, and just a reminder, see, we are taking every precaution, as you can probably understand. We have a very small team here this morning, and uh, in fact, this kind of messes with my head, because I had to make a very significant adjustment in my mind this morning. I'm basically asking my question, am I preaching to an empty room, or do I have the privilege of being invited into your homes and I'm choosing to go with the second one because I think that is actually the reality of this moment. I want to thank you guys for having me into your lounge room and it's really hard to imagine the Apostle Paul having any concept of virtual church but it's not that big a stretch when we consider that the most elementary form of the New Testament church was pretty much what you're doing this morning. What we're experiencing this morning is this. We are the most resilient and adaptable expression of the body of Christ. Families, individuals and households of faith meeting together in worship to pray and to learn from Scripture in our homes. Guys, does this mean that this is the best way to do church or even the only form of church? Clearly not. The church has grown, it's changed, but has it really changed that much? Well, this morning we're going to jump into uh, 1 Corinthians and we're going to probably see that the church hasn't changed a whole lot in a couple of thousand years. We're still a resilient bunch. I heard somebody say that the church is really, or at least the form of church you're experiencing this morning, is like a cockroach. It can go through the most dire situations, even a nuclear holocaust, because we're going to be together no matter what. And so we are the most resilient and this morning the most elementary form of church. I'm really comforted by, and you should be as well, Matthew 18 verse 20, this was Jesus, when he said, for where two or three come together in my name, there I'm with them. Friends and family, I want you to know this morning that we prayed, come Holy Spirit, and I think you joined with us. Where you are this morning with your loved ones, he's there. And I want to add this to that statement. If you're sitting in your room on your own this morning, then I'm with you. And that makes a quorum. We have two or three, and so the Holy Spirit's with us. Again, guys, just bow your heads. I'm going to pray before we jump into this. And I promise not to have too much humor this morning. So Lord, we invite you to come into every lounge room. We thank you that you're here. Lord, we thank you that in an even greater way, you've gone out of the building. We've let you out. We've let you out of the box that we've tried to keep you in. I thank you, Jesus, for the prophetic words we've had over the years that have said that this building would have transparent walls. This morning, it all makes sense. And so we thank you, Jesus, for that as well. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way amongst us. Amen. And so, guys, as I said this morning, if you're sitting in your lounge room alone, then together, you and I and the team here, the little production team we have, we are a part of what you're doing. I want to thank God that through technology, we could worship this morning, we could have kids' church, And we can even share the word of God. And so what we're going to do is we're going to continue on. If you've been traveling with us as a church and we've been in different forms lately, we've been looking at the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. If you're joining us for the first time, this is going to make perfect sense to you. I want to explain that Paul planted this church in Corinth in the first century, around 53 AD in fact. The first century Corinthian church was, in fact, the beginning of a movement. This church started in a city of 90,000 people. Imagine the ancient world 2,000 years ago, a major center of 90,000 people. The city of Corinth was a center known for its commerce. It was a center known for the prostitution and sex industry. I'm sorry, kids, put your fingers in your ears. I'm not going to say any more about that. It was a church that was famous for its competitive sports, 
Olympic type events that took place. And Corinth, Corinth was also a center for education. Greek philosophy and intellectualism flourished in this city. And so what we see in this church is a church planted in the middle of this bustling city. And it was a rapidly growing church. And when gathered together, it would have been equivalent to what we would today call a mega church in the context of that day. This church was clearly having growing pains and its leaders were struggling to hold it together and struggling to set the foundations for authentic Christian life. The Corinthian church had grown so rapidly that the ways of the world had literally flooded into the church. And so the coming chapters that we're going to look at beyond the first chapter, which we looked at last week, will show us several things. Firstly, it's going to show us that growth is messy. Growth is messy. Now, at the morning, at this morning, the only thing, only mess you can probably see is the mess that you've left on the kitchen sink or the kids strewn all over the floor or their toys or whatever's going on at home. I can only imagine. We had three kids, I've got nine grandkids, and they continue to make a mess. But as I said last week, others have said that this is a problem church, the church in Corinth. My take on it is actually a little different. This church in Corinth was actually a church full of life. It was a church full of the life of Jesus. It was a church full of spirit. And yet, at the same time, it was a church full of multiple messes. The first chapter of 1 Corinthians clearly shows that this church had the favor and the grace of God on it. Let's have a look at that. From chapter 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, and from verse 4, this is the Apostle Paul, and he says, I always thank God for you because of the, his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Everything else, as we read through this letter, can be read through that filter. Paul isn't beating them up, he's not scolding them for being bad, he's simply bringing sanity to the mess. And then in verse 5, he says, For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. This is a proud father talking to the children that he's birthed into the kingdom. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. Friends, this is an introduction that really we need to read the entire passage, the entire book of 1 Corinthians through. Here was a church with God's grace. What is that? Well, it's the favor of God. God had favor on them. In other words, everything they did, he was there with them. He was a church that had a powerful testimony of the salvation of Jesus Christ. These were new converts. These were Greeks who were far away from Jesus. I think that this book is prophetic in terms of the journey that Southland Church is on. This was a church that wasn't lacking in any spiritual gifts. Guys, you know that we've been practicing this stuff for years, for such a time as this, as we keep saying. We are not lacking spiritual gifts, and the church in Corinth was bustling and brimming over with spiritual gifts. This was a church that was sanctified and blameless through the blood of Jesus Christ. This was a church who was called into fellowship with the Son of God. And so I think it's a bit blindsided when we start to focus on this and say that it's a problem church. And yet if you buy a commentary on the book of 1 Corinthians or you read about the early church in Corinth, you'll probably be inundated with the problems of it. I love this church. It feels so much like our church. I love this uh, passage in Proverbs and if there is one verse that applies to the church in Corinth and perhaps also to Southland Church, it's this one. 
And I've used the King James Version because it's really easy to match it with what the original language is saying. In Proverbs 14, 4, it says, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. You see, the Hebrew word translated crib in the King James Version can also be translated stall. And it's a reference to the kind of stall that you find in a barn. I want to say this, that if a barn has no oxen in it, there's not going to be any poo. You understand that? If there are oxen in the barn, there's going to be a mess. But you see, it's the kind of mess that comes with life. Because the verse goes on to say, much increase comes with the strength of the ox. Guys, that's us. We're not called to be a perfect church. We're not called to be sanitized, except for the current situation. But we are called to grow. This was a church that was in growth mode. And so the Corinthian church was new, it was vibrant, and it was messy. This season, you and I are in a time of preparation and opportunity. Please don't sit at home and mope. There are things to do. There are plans to make. This season won't go forever. This that we are in now is the aftermath of a demonic virus. And demonic fear has come to the whole world. And so as the church of Jesus Christ... My friends, this is an opportunity because I sense, and I'm I'm not a revivalist. I've always been a little bit critical of some of the revivalist movements, but if ever there's going to be a revival, it's now. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to get activated and I want you to get activated with this as well. But what will it take? Well, this prophetic book goes on to tell us what it will take. It's going to require a bold proclamation of the cross of Jesus Christ. And together we're going to do this. Let's pick it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 1. Again, Paul says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that, you, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Friends, the gospel hasn't changed. The moment we take our eyes off God, the moment we stop relying on the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit for the proclamation of the gospel, we've lost the plot. When we read this passage, knowing the background and setting of first century Corinth, it makes much more sense than if we just plucked the scripture out of midair and tried to hang all of our doctrines on it. Guys, this is the importance of Bible study, of understanding Scripture, of expositorily going through the Scripture and unpacking it. When Paul said, when I come to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, he was speaking to the heart of Corinthian culture. We can do the same today. Our culture isn't that different. We're confronted today by opinions from every angle. There are experts by the dozen. They say, just refer to the experts. Which one? They're everywhere. There's an expert for every occasion, and sometimes there's that much crossover, you can't pick the difference. And so the same applies to us. Eloquence and superior wisdom won't cut it. The gospel is about the power of Jesus. The statement that Paul makes here was countercultural. And it cut through worldly wisdom like a knife through butter. It wasn't a cheap commodity. It wasn't something that was free and easy in the city like every other thing that we spoke about. You see, the wisdom of God is not about the wisdom of our culture. It's not even about the wisdom of our experts. 
Paul goes on to say this, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Friends, we don't get to check our brains out at the door, but the bottom line is the wisdom of the world, we can't stand up to it. It will bombard us. The moment you get online, it's coming from every angle. But the truth is, the one thing that remains, the only thing that will stand for eternity, is the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead, and that through those two single acts, you now have access to the throne of God. This is a clear statement of the awesome superiority of the power of the cross over every shred of human wisdom. And every piece of knowledge that seeks to save us falsely, we cannot survive through those things. Friends, I believe this is a now word. I believe it is our hope. And I believe that any hope in a vaccine or anything else in medical science is a good thing, but it's not going to save us for eternal situations. The only thing that can save us is the cross of Jesus. If it's a vaccine only, then surely we will die. You see, sometimes in this life, if we don't make decisions about eternity, everything comes to a horrible end. It's in Christ alone that we have life forevermore. You see, guys, we need to be very seriously asking our friends and families what happens after this life. This is a poignant time in history. We don't have to jam uh, our version of the gospel down their throats, but it's all here in black and white. It's very simple. The next thing that happens in this wonderful book is that we learn that our wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. You see, we don't rely on the wisdom of the world, but we do rely on wisdom that comes from above. And so from verse 6, it says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who is coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And then in verse 10, but God has revealed it to us by his Holy Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by, to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. And then finally, verse 14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to man's judgment. For all, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see, guys, it's interesting that Paul isn't saying that all wisdom is foolish. There is a wisdom that comes from God that we should speak among ourselves. It is for the spiritually mature. The preaching of the cross breaks through the wisdom of the world. But there is a wisdom from God that's for us, his church. It's expressed through spiritual words. It comes through the word of God. It comes through prophetic revelation. It comes through fellowship, which at the moment is probably happening through Zoom, Skype, or any of the above. Paul says this, We do, however, speak a word of wisdom among the mature. 
but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of the age who are coming to nothing. You see, guys, the rulers of this age is a collective reference to a diabolical spiritual ruler and his demonic army and the puppet human leaders under which he rules. Did you hear what I just said? I could regret that. Please don't uh, try and build your eschatology around that one statement. The fact is, the rules, the rulers of this age are out there and they're also over us in, in, in human form. And so people respond to that. We know this is a collective cohort because Paul refers to them as rulers, plural. Paul says, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Please hear this, friends. I'm not saying that world leaders are evil per se, at least not all of them. I do ask this question, though. Where are they receiving their orders from? That's the crucial question. I know a bit about leadership, and it feels a lot like many leaders are just following the leader in front of them. Maybe it's just me, but I think true leadership is actually a really scarce commodity. Guys, this is where we come in. This is where we come in. I want you to ask, I want to ask you, please pray for our Prime Minister. I think he's doing a really good job. But even if he was doing a terrible job, we must pray for him. We need to pray for all the leaders around the world. We need to pray that something will break, that someone will see the revelation and uh, that true leadership will stand up. You see, the church of this age must learn again to hear from God. The church has got to lead. We've got to lead ourselves. We've got to live in accordance with the word of God and we must lead by example. We may not have a platform at government level. Some will. But we do have a platform at our family level, guys, and that's what this book's all about. The most elementary part of church, we must lead it well. Isn't it incredible that the, the qualification for an elder is that he leads his family well? Verse 12 says, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. If we really believe this, then we believe it's true for all believers. It's not believe, it's not true just for a few. Friends, this is the time for the wisdom of God to be revealed, and we are the people who must re receive it and administer it. And there are many opportunities for that coming. Some of them are now. Yesterday, I was able to stand on a chair two meters back from the fence, mind you, and talk to my neighbor. There are people out there, guys, who are fearful. Many people. Much of the church has even fallen to it. But we have to stand up. In verse 14, it says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, it's you and I, it's people that know Christ that will hang on and hear the wisdom of God through this situation. Mums and dads, you are the spiritual parents and leaders of your households. Now is your time to lead. I want to summarize just a few points this morning by saying this. No matter where you are or where you have come from, I am here to proclaim to you this morning the only way to eternal life is through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the message of 1 Corinthians. Your sins can all be forgiven and your life can be secured only by surrendering to his lordship. There is no other way, there never has been. There has been an illusion that there were other ways, but it's all been stripped off now. And it's time for the true church of Jesus Christ to arise. Romans 4 verse 25, again the Apostle Paul wrote this and he says it well. 
He has delivered over to death for our sins. He was delivered over to death for our sins and he was raised to life for our justifications. You see, the message has never changed. Jesus was crucified, historically true fact, proven in history, attested to to this day. Then he rose from the dead and again, the, the evidence for the resurrection is far greater than the very evidence for the existence of Alexander the Great. This is a true fact. This morning, friends, if you believe eternal life is found in Christ alone, I'm going to ask you to stand right where you are. Whether you're at home, whether you are the team here with us this morning, there is no discrimination in this. Even if you've never heard the gospel of Christ before, and for once it makes sense to you because God has opened your heart up, I want you to stand with me this morning. And I'm going to pray a prayer And I want to invite you to join in to that prayer with me. It's going to be easy because the words will be up for you. For those that know Christ, this is an affirmation of faith. For those that don't know Christ, this is the prayer that will save your life. If you speak it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, this prayer has the power to set you free from eternal death. And it begins like this. I believe you are the Son of God. Does that sound familiar to to those that have been around a while? This sounds like a creed, doesn't it? I believe you are the Son of God. That word belief in the Latin means by life. By my life I will show you are the Son of God. I believe you came to earth as a man. I believe that you suffered under Pontius Pilate and were crucified on a Roman cross You took the full penalty for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead three days later and that because of my confession, I now rise to eternal life with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Guys, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. And I want to encourage you that if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to ask you, please contact us. Jump on our website, southlandchurch.com.au. There's a contact page on the right-hand side of the page. Please let us know if you prayed that prayer for the first time because we would be delighted to join you in your work, walk with Jesus. We have people that can help you. At the moment, it'll be by remote means. But there comes a day when I'm going to give you a hug personally. It's so good to have prayed that prayer. If that was the first time you prayed that prayer or if you rededicated your life to Jesus and you meant that prayer, then you now stand out differently and the wisdom that I spoke of this morning that comes from God is now yours. The spiritual discerning that cuts other people out from hearing it is now yours. Just while you're standing, if you're still in that place, or even if you want to lay on the floor, guys, it's up to you. Let me pray for you. We're going to pray together. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come now. We thank you that you care. We thank you for salvation in Jesus. Lord, we thank you that it's been freely given and we receive it this morning. Also, in the name of Jesus, I speak peace to your home. I break the power of fear and around the boundary of your household, we declare this morning the protection by the blood of Jesus from every pestilence, from the virus, from intruders, From whatever we're going to see from this point forward, Lord, we ask for your protection and we're confident in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God bless you guys. We're done for Sunday morning apart from... We're just going to finish with worship because that's what we do. So again, don't be too um, 
ashamed of worshipping, you've got your kids around you, kids as mum and dad. If you're on your own, then you can crank the volume and just go for it. But folks, we're going to worship together. Wherever you are, and I know there are people all around the world watching this this morning. There's a very big cluster here in Adelaide because that's where Southland Church hangs out. So guys, let's worship.